Okay, good. So tell me about Nevernight. Like, I am pretty sure I read somewhere that Storm Dancer came to you in a dream. How how do you come up with Nevernight? The world, the characters, the story. It it started with a drunken conversation on New Year's Eve uh, that I watched. I wasn't part of the conversation. I watched it between a couple of uh, lady friends of mine, like not not lady friends, like friends of mine who are ladies, um, and they were arguing about a particular word. It's like it's a, I presume I can't swear in this thing, so I won't. But it's a it's a curse word used to describe female genitalia, um, and it's considered to be the worst word in the English language. And they were arguing about why that was. And one of them took the point of view that it's kind of a sexist and ridiculous point of view to view it as the worst word because you know, female genitalia is no worse or better than male genitalia. Uh, and I started thinking about that as an argument and it stuck in my head and I went away a few days later and wrote a scene in which a boy and a girl had a similar conversation and the girl kind of smoked a cigarette and told the boy why what he thought was wrong was wrong. And that was that was kind of the first scene of the book. And at the end of the scene, I didn't I didn't really know who this girl was or what she wanted, um, but I wanted to find out. So I, I read a book to find out. I invented a world to find out. So that that scene is still in the book. It's I think it's the end of chapter five, and the wording of it hasn't really changed since I first wrote it down. That was kind of at the end. of I would have been the start of 2013, actually. It was New Year's Eve 2013. So, yeah, uh, that, that was kind of the birth of Mia, the trick. And, yeah, I just I built the world and the story about her around that. I think that scene kind of sums up who she is better than any other scene in the book. The way she views life, she's very pragmatic and uh, a little confrontational, opinionated, which I like about her. So... Based on that, obviously, it's safe to say that Mia is what started everything as far as the story, the book, um, given that it started <clears throat> based on that conversation. So I already know the answer to this, but how this, how do you th think Mia up? Like, I mean, how do you create her as the person she is? I mean, she's an interesting character and she's unapologetic and even though she's still learning and trying to get to what she needs as far as her goals she's still very interesting and so how do you how do you think her up what what inspires you to create mia uh, visually she was I, I don't know if you guys have her in the states there's a there's a cartoon character called emily the strange do you know do you know emily the strange i don't know if it's an australian thing or american thing or what um, but she's this little goth girl with kind of long black hair and short black fringe and she hangs out with uh, a cat. Uh, it's kind of really simple visual line work. Um, and that was kind of a little bit of the visual inspiration for me. I imagined that Emily the Strange character growing up, maybe 10 years older, carrying a broadsword and that was, that was the basis for the visuals. But she's also inspired by a song. So I'm going to get into Mr. Kindly in a second, but you were mentioning how she's inspired, you know, by different things and um, not necessarily by anybody specific in your life, but just a combination of a bunch of stuff. I'm sure you get this question a lot, um, but why female characters? Storm Dancer has a teenage um, Japanese girl 
and now again we see a main character who's a girl i mean which is great but being that you're a guy wouldn't it be easier to write a guy's point of view make the main character a boy instead of a girl why do you choose main characters that are female yeah it's a really good question i I don't know if I choose them to tell you the truth. Um, I mean, in, in the Illuminated series, I write Ezra in, in Gemini, which is coming out soon. I write Mick, so I write the main characters in those books there. So I guess in terms of books and series, I'm kind of two for two. So I don't know. I, I write the characters that appear in my head. In terms of it being easier for me to write a male character, I, I'm not sure about that. Unless I was writing a book about... 40 year old dude who sits around his house in his tracksuit pants and our boots and plays guitar hero I'm always going to be making up something about the characters that I'm writing you know I've, ne I've never been I've never been in space I've never picked up a sword and hit somebody with it I've never been in a battle I've never killed anyone um, so I'm not entirely sure life situations believably is any more challenging or easier than, than writing someone who's not of my gender. Um, all my beta readers are women. Um, I've got some very smart ladies who read all my stuff. Um, I don't have a single guy reading my stuff. Well, I have to print. I'm not sure why that is. But they're, like I say, they're very sharp. They call me on any of my uh, mailisms that might sneak into the text. And, you know, like I say, I'm, I'm not entirely sure the idea that you can't write a character of your own gender is accurate. I mean, all, all writers are inventing characters. Like I say, unless they're writing autobiographies, we're, we're always telling lies, I guess, creatively. Uh, and it's a matter of you know observation and experience and paying attention to the world around you and speaking to people in those situations and getting informed opinions on the work after you've written it to make sure it's legitimate. But, yeah... I, I don't think it's any trickier um, not writing a girl than it is writing a murderer because I've never been either of those things. So Mia is not the only character, obviously, in the book. There's a, an actual quite big array of different characters, boys, girls, adults, um, other teenagers. Besides Mia, tell us a little bit about the other characters. I found that I liked them all. Of course, until I didn't, um, but they were they were all very they were all very unique and, and very interesting, especially Jessamine. Um, I really like Carlotta, too, even though I didn't really see much about her. But tell us a little bit about the the characters that make up the story, both the professors and the teenagers that go to the school with Mia. Sure, I, I guess the, the other main character in the book is a boy called Trick. Jessamine is, I guess, Mia's nemesis. Um, 
she is the daughter of a general who was murdered as a result of Mia's father's failed rebellion. So she kind of views Mia's family as directly responsible for the downfall of her own. And interestingly, Jessamine is named after one of my readers. Like way back in 2013, when I was still kicking around ideas for the book and I hadn't sold it yet, I was still writing it. I couldn't think of a name, and so I put out a call on Twitter. If someone could think of a name, I'd throw it into the book. And a girl called Jessie, who I got to meet for the first time at BA this year, uh, she just put her hand up and, and chokingly said, Jessie's a good name for a villain. Because I told everyone I was going to be a bad character, an evil character. And I kind of tweaked the name, and Jessamine is, is what we ended up coming out with. So yeah, that's cool. Uh, and the teachers, there are four schools. I guess four disciplines in the school in the Red Church and they are weaponry uh, seduction kind of stealth pickpocketry and uh, poison craft so the teacher of weaponry is a man called Solus he's blind and he is I guess he's something of a nemesis for me as well she has a run in with him really early on and that kind of defines their relationship for the rest of the book she's no one spoil it but she's showing off a little bit in class and he puts her in her place there is spider killer who is the teacher of poisons she's another Dwemeri but she's uh, full blooded and she she is probably the teacher that gets along with Mia the best simply because Mia is also quite studied in poison craft so she's she's kind of spider killer star pupil I guess but that doesn't make her nice and that doesn't mean she gives me or any breaks spider killer is probably the most dangerous teacher in the whole school she's kind of fun to write Alia is the teacher of masks so she's the, she teaches seduction and manipulation and last is Mouser he teaches pickpocketry and stealth and he's something of a ladies man and a, and a bit of a tomato like I guess so between those four, they're, they're kind of the personalities of the church, and the church is headed up by Reverend Mother Drusilla, who is an old lady, or appears at least to be an old lady, uh, but she's the most accomplished assassin in the church. She's got nearly 100 kills to her name, so even though she appears to be this nice, sweet, matronly grandmother type figure, she's actually a, a ruthless murderer, so that's a nice dichotomy. So... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into this since you mentioned the fact that uh, being that they're going to this school to become assassins, and there's only a certain amount of people that can become a blade. So it's not that they can all go and they can all become blades. There's only certain spots. So they're in a way, well, very much in a way competing against each other. So being attracted to one of your peers is probably not the best of situations to be in. Um, your previous books have uh, not, I mean, they haven't had explicit sex. Uh, Never Night Does. And though they do have something in common, they have characters that range in between the ages of 16 and 18. And uh, this has opened a little bit of interesting discussion as to whether this is suitable for younger audiences. So it, it makes me wonder whether when you're writing, do you feel at any point restricted by genres do you ever feel you shouldn't put certain content in order not to be boxed into a particular audience or do you just write and you know let it fall where it falls no, it's, it's definitely a consideration um when we're writing illuminate stuff for example we know that there are lines that we probably can't cross um never know it's it's being produced by an adult of St. Martin's Press, so I had a little more free range in terms of the content that I could put in there. That, that said, I knew that, not so much when I was writing it, because I was writing Illuminate at the same time, so I didn't really know where my career was going to take me at that point, but certainly when I was editing Never Night earlier this year, you know, Illuminate was kind of out by that point, and it, it's done pretty well for itself, and we've got a pretty big audience as a result, and a lot of those people are teenagers you know I get to meet them when we go out on tour so I knew that you know readers who liked Illuminate were probably going to pick up Nevernight when it came out and if they're teenagers they were going to be exposed to this more mature 
content. So that, that was certainly something I thought about. But at the end of the day, it is an adult book, and this is the book that I wanted to write. And the idea that YA has somehow become synonymous with PG is it's a little strange to me. Um, the idea that there are certain things in YA that you can can't do, particularly pertaining to sex, is it's kind of odd. It's a little bit archaic as well, and it's totally not true in the sense that anyone who's read A Court of Mist of Fury by Sarah Jane Haas, I mean, that, that's brought out by Bloomsbury Kids, that's a YA novel, and there is full-on explicit sex in that. So in terms of what you can and can't do in YA anymore, the, the boundaries seem to be ever-widening. But the idea that... I don't know, this, this is a really long and complicated answer a complicated discussion but the, the idea that sexual content is somehow taboo where content that's extraordinarily violent uh, and gruesome is, is okay and that, this isn't just an attitude in books it's an attitude in television and film as well like the idea that a film like The Hunger Games which is basically 24 kids being dropped into a pit and murdering each other is, is rated PG uh, you can turn on your television at 7.30 at night in prime time and you know, see NCIS. I was watching an episode of NCIS in the day when I walked into the room while my wife was watching it and there was a, there was a headless, charred, naked body laid out on a slab. Like you couldn't see any genitalia, obviously, because it had been charred down to the bone. But laying there on the slab while two people kind of quipped and drew one liners back and forth across each other. Like the idea that that's okay but you can't show a breast or, you know, heaven forbid, a penis or a vagina or people react like the sky is falling down. That, that seems really messed up to me. You know, teenagers are naturally curious about sex. It's a perfectly natural and healthy uh, part of their lives and the idea that it's taboo or dirty or that it shouldn't be talked about seems a little messed up to me. You know, when I, I was a kid... I was reading Stephen King when I was 10 years old. You know, a lot of what I found out about sex was through books. Um, and as long as it's treated responsibly and it's a scene between two consenting partners who are going into it with eyes open, you know, I don't, I don't see a hell of a lot wrong with that. Considering the other alternatives through which teenagers could be exposed to sexual content these days, you know, would, would you rather your kids learn about sex by reading about it in a book or by logging into RedTube, you know, or YouPorn or something like that, you know, as, as far as channels through which teenagers can be exposed to conversations about sex, I think books are, are a pretty good one, given the other alternatives. Do but, you... you know, at, the, at the end of the day, sorry, go on. No, do you, do you feel it's changing, though? Like, do you, do you feel at all that... I mean, you do mention uh, Sarah's book, and, and that is <clears throat> very true. Her book has, I think, crossed boundaries that we haven't seen before. Um, do you feel we're kind of moving in that direction where it's, I guess, opening up to, you know, I don't know, I mean, I guess including it more with, without making it all about it, but just, you know, including it more since it's a normal part of life, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, the definition of what YA is, is really interesting. I mean, I, I've never had YA explained to me in a way that satisfies me, as if given, given a definition of what it is, um, other than something that exists purely through publisher fiat. Like, a book is YA because the publisher who is bringing it out is a YA imprint. You know, in terms of content, the only difference between them and I and something like a court of Mr. Fury is the publisher logo on the spine. You know, Sarah's not doing anything in that book that I'm not doing in mine. Uh, I don't know why, well, mine's probably a little bit more violent, but in terms of sexual content anyway. So the, the interesting thing is that, you know, some people treat YA as a genre and it's really not. Uh, it's a demographic. Some people treat YA as, as like a ratings guide. You know, these are books for teenagers, and so you'll expect to find some content not present in the pages. But it, it's not that either. Um, so yeah, no, I, don't, I don't really know what YA is. You know, 
depending on what you read, between 50 and 60 percent of the readership from what are not teenagers at all. Um, you know, not all YA books are coming of age stories. You know, take the Hunger Games again, for example. You know, Katniss is basically a fully formed adult at the start of that book. She's the primary caregiver for her family. She already has views about the government established at the start of that book, and her views about the government don't change over the course of that book. She's already pragmatic. She's already a person who will do what needs to be done for her family. And her attitudes don't change. She doesn't grow up over the course of that book, you know. So YA books don't have to be coming of age tales either. Uh, you know, I don't know what YA is other than a concept invented by publishers in order to market to a particular kind of reader. And if that's the only definition that people can come up with, and like I say, I, don't, I haven't heard a better one. Then in terms of content, why it could be whatever the author's writing, why I choose it to be. And that's probably a good thing. So just so that we're... Yeah, that's a really long and involved conversation. Just so that we're clear and uh, there's no misunderstanding, we do know that Never Night is being um, released by an adult um, imprint, so um, it is considered an adult yes. series, but then we're safe to say that, you know, exercise your judgment and, you know, <clears throat> read at your own risk, I guess? Definitely. I mean, I mean the, first, the first page of the book, like the prologue of the book is called Caveat Emptor, which is Latin for buyer beware. The narrator basically sits you down and tells you, look, this is the kind of book that you're in for. This is the kind of girl that this book is about. She's, she's not, she's not uh, a sunshine and kittens kind of person. She's, she's a killer, you know. Nevernite is about a neophyte assassin learning to become the killer that, you know, one day the entire world will know the name of. You can't write a book like that and not have her get a bit of blood on her. Uh, so it, it, it's going to be violent, it's, it's going to be dark. Um, but yeah, it is, it is published by an adult imprint. Um, just because the teenager is, uh, I'm sorry, the protagonist is a teenager doesn't mean it's, it's a YA book. But that said, you know, I, I knew a lot of people would read it who are teenagers simply because that's, you know, part of my fan base that's come to me through Illuminate. And, and, I am totally comfortable with the idea of teenagers reading this book. I don't, I don't think there's anything in there that you can't see on, on television or, or shouldn't be talking about with you know, your friends or your parents or, or people that you can have those kinds of conversations with. And the idea that... Um, the idea that authors are somehow meant to take the role of educators or... Um, dictate morality to the to the people that read their books is, is a little strange to me. You know, we're we're content creators, we're entertainers, and we write the books or make the films that we want to make, and people can read them and see them and make their own judgments. No, I agree. I mean, having <laughs> having read having read the book myself, and and, and being the parent of uh, two teenagers, I. I agree. I don't. I don't think there's anything that would make me uncomfortable for them reading in Nevernight and in many other books. Uh, but you know, basically the same sentiment that you know, it's not stuff that they can't find anywhere else. Um, there was another um, element to your book that was very interesting to me because I haven't seen it in a while, probably since I was in college. There is a lot of footnotes. Um, we go through the story, and as we go through the story, we find little pieces of information added to the bottom of the page, um, pretty much on every page. Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, that to me was very interesting, and it added so much more depth to the story, but it's just something that we don't see that much. So why the footnotes? Um, I am I'm a huge fantasy nerd. I kind of grew up reading classic fantasy, you know, Tolkien and Eddings and Feist and Ursula Glynn and, you know, all those, those great old writers who created these huge, fantastic, elaborate worlds. And I, and I love kind of deep, granular world building in the fantasy that I read. Uh, but at the same time, I acknowledge not everybody does. I, I like writing that stuff and I like 
are creating a world that you can kind of drill down below the surface of. But I understand that some readers just want to get to the fireworks factory to use a, a Simpsons quote. Some readers, you know, don't, don't get a whole lot out of it. So when a thought would occur to me about expanding on a particular piece of history or piece of trivia, I, I stumbled across the thought of, of doing it via footnotes in that way. If you are the kind of reader who likes finding out, you know, all the detail about the world, you know, why that particular mood of sword fighting is called Caravaggio, why that pub is called the Queen's Bed, why, you know, the, the, how the coinage system of the country works, that kind of granular detail. If you're the kind of reader who likes the stuff that you read footnotes and get more out of the world that way, if you're not the kind of reader who enjoys it, then you can just skip the footnotes and get on with the story, you're not going to miss a hell of a lot about Mia or who she is or where she ends up. You might miss a little bit about the world, but in terms of its impact on the story that you're reading, it's, it's not going to have a huge one. But also, I mean, the, the footnotes, the tone of the footnotes is also intentional as well. Like the narrator in Nevernight is a character, um, and it's a character that you've met by the end of the book. You don't know who it is, but by the end of book one, you've met the person who's telling the story. And that character occasionally kind of breaks the fourth wall and addresses you, the reader, directly. And their tone of voice, I hope anyway, is, is, is kind of funny. Like they're making jokes, they're kind of cracking wise and sharing a wink with you as the reader. And that was a device that I used to kind of lighten the mood a little bit. I realized that early on, if I let it be, this book was going to be incredibly grim and incredibly bleak. And that's not really the kind of book that I like reading. One of my favorite fantasy reads of recent years was The Lives of Lock Lamar by Scott Lynch. And the reason I love that book so much is within the first kind of 20, 30 pages, I was giggling as I was reading it like it was genuinely funny. And again, that, that's a story that could have very easily strayed into grim dark territory, but Scott was cracking jokes. Uh, and that, that lightened the tone of the book. And that's kind of what I was trying to achieve with those footnotes in Never Note as well, to give you a little bit of a smile and poke fun. Because every fantasy kind of can take itself a little seriously if it lets itself. And there is a, you know, an entire subgenre of epic fantasy called Grimdark, where it's intentionally uh, as bleak as it can possibly be. And I, I didn't want this book to be like that. It could very easily have become that book. So the footnotes were a way for me to, to lighten the mood, bring a little, little bit of levity to the proceedings. Hopefully, anyway, that was the intent. Okay, so as far as the footnotes, you don't necessarily have to read them. I would personally suggest that people do read them because I found them very funny as I moved along through the book. Um, but if you don't read the footnotes, if you just decide to skip it because either whether it distracts you or you, you just want to get on with it, you don't necessarily need to read them in order to really get the full on from the story. No, I mean, there are a few anecdotes about me when she was a kid. But they're mostly stories about the world. Um, like I say, why a pub is called a particular name or what the history of this mode of sword fighting is or how the economic structures in the country work, uh, why a building was called what it is. It, it's, it's trivia, really, about the world that kind of adds that extra layer of granularity for people who enjoy that kind of thing. But no, you're not, you're not going to miss any vital clues about the story if you skip the notes. Okay, so you're working on three different books right now for a completely different series. For a completely different series, so I, I can only imagine how crazy that is in between getting copy edits, uh, writing the actual book, and thinking of everything that comes along with each one of the projects. How how do you sit down and separate this three vastly different worlds and work just on one without having the other two distract you? It's a really good question. Uh, I have to partition my time nowadays um, and I'll work in blocks that tend to be you know a couple of weeks long at least when I'm when I'm drafting I tend to block out months and months on end uh, but I have to arrange that around you know touring schedules and promotion schedules now so that's getting a little bit trickier but working on multiple projects for me is actually even though it sounds intimidating it's actually a really good way for me to work I had a I had a maths teacher in year 10, I was terrible at maths, and I used to freak out at exams, that would stress me out, and he told me something that's kind of stuck with me my whole life, he said, when you reach a question that you can't find, you don't know the answer to, 
Uh, don't just sit there and stare at the question and get stressed out and move on to the next one. And your, your subconscious mind will work on the problem even while you're not consciously considering it. So for me, working on multiple projects is, is actually really good in that way. If I, if I reach a point where I'm at an impasse, I don't quite know what comes next. I can shift gears and work on a new book. It's only on the solution to the problem that I come across. So yeah, it, it is a matter of just partitioning time. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not working day to day on different projects. If I have to stop in the middle of drafting project one and then come back to it later, you know, and the first three or four days will be spent rereading everything that I've done and editing and kind of getting myself back into the headspace of the book before I can start writing again. But yeah, it, it, it works for me. I'm, I'm not sure how. I'm not sure why. I just really like writing, I guess, and I have a little bit of virus Catholic guilt if I'm sitting around the house not doing anything. I feel I feel guilty about it. I feel like I need to start working on something new. So hopefully, three books is um, or three different projects is enough to keep me busy for a while. <laughs> it does sound a bit crazy, but it's fun. You know, I'm lucky to be doing what I'm doing. I'm lucky to have readers who want more of my projects. So uh, I don't ever want to take that for granted. I don't ever want to be sitting around not working to me that that seems a waste that seems a little bit selfish and a little bit arrogant so speaking about the three projects that you're working on we know you have gemina and eliminate three coming and we have two more books coming for nevernight yep. tell us about this this third project that's coming is it 2018 yeah well i actually have two other projects but Oh, so it's four uh, projects then. Well, technically it's three because we're not working on the fourth one yet. But Amy and I have sold the series that's coming after Eliminate, um, but we won't start working on that until next year. So we've got a hand in book three of the Eliminate files this, sorry, next month in August, and then we'll start the editing process and the artwork process, and we'll start writing that new project in January. So that is a... That's another sci-fi series. It's called The Andromeda Cycle, and it's about... It's kind of a, a cross between Guardians of the Galaxy and Star Trek, like a Starfleet Academy thing. So this golden boy character who's kind of good at everything and is top of his class, he gets landed with a bunch of misfits and losers, and they still have to save the universe. So it's kind of like The Breakfast Club meets Star Trek, I guess. Uh, and that's multiple point of view that I think there's six characters in that and I'm writing three and Amy writing three and it's going to be awesome uh, it's a lot of fun we're really looking forward to jumping into it next year but like I say we've got to write Illuminate 3 first we're about three quarters done on that now though. and I have another series which is just me that's a solo series that's also coming out on Random House and the first book of that will be coming out in spring of 2018 that's called Lifelike and like I said, that, that's a pure YA project, so not as heavy um, or as smutty as Nevernight is. And that is about a girl who finds it's set in a post-collapse world. It's kind of Mad Max-esque. There's been a war between androids and humans, and the androids have been outlawed as a result of this war. And the story is about a girl who finds the ruins of an android on a scrap heap, uh, and the android looks like a beautiful boy. And he holds the secret to the revolt, why it happened, and um, how, what her role in it was. So yeah, that's that's really cool. I've written the first one of that already, and I'm handing that in start of August, so you know, probably a week or so from now. Uh, and that's that's a really cool book. I like it a lot. It's um, it's different to anything that I've done before. Uh, it was a hell of a lot of fun to write and. Yeah, really looking forward to it coming out. So to recap all the things that we have to look forward to, we have um, Nevernight coming out in less than a month. Um, yeah. And then we have Gemina uh, coming October 18th, at least yeah. in the U.S. Um, a new series coming out, well, a new book coming up spring of 2017? No, that's 18. 18. So coming out in 2018, and the Andromeda Cycle will be starting in. So in 2017, I'll be bringing out, we'll be bringing out Illuminate 3, 
and probably Never Night 2 as well. I'm still in the process of writing that. I'm going to be writing that through to the end of this year, and we'll, we'll see how we go if I get it finished in time. I mean, epic fantasy books are, are bigger and more complex, so they take a little longer to write. Um, you know, Life Like is 90,000 words, and Never Night was 170, I think, so that's almost two books in one. So, you know, they naturally take a little longer to write, so we'll see how we go. We're going to be on tour for Gemini as well in pretty much from most of November. I think we're over there for almost a month. Uh, we just got our tour schedule the other day and we're, I think we're on tour for like three and a half weeks or something. It's crazy. And we're wrapping up in Yule Fest in the middle of November. So uh, that's going to take a big chunk out of the writing time as well. But, you know, we're on tour and tour is amazing. Getting out there, meeting readers and hanging out with our fellow authors is, is probably the coolest part of the job. So we're really looking forward to getting out there again. Although we're going to be there during the election. We figured that out the other day. We're going to be in America when you guys decide who the next president is, so I'm not sure what state we want to be in when that all goes down. And that's going to be one interesting, that's going to make for one interesting tour, at least, uh, <laughs> yeah. to be, you know, I'm not necessarily going to go into my opinions on that, but um, it, it definitely will make for an interesting, interesting. <laughs> for an interesting tour. So I'm guessing we're going to, we're going to get some news on dates and cities, uh, probably in the near future for Gemini as far as touring? Yeah, really soon. Um, I'd say probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, news will start to filter out about Gemini uh, by the end of August. We have some really interesting and amazing and exciting news that we've been, we had to keep under our hat uh, for the last year almost. It's kind of been driving us a little bit nuts. It's so secretive that our publisher has a code word for it. Like, they're not even allowed to talk about it internally by name. They have to refer to it by its code name it's, it's that secretive and crazy but when news of that breaks um, that's going to be really exciting we are, we are super chuffed it's been really hard sitting on that news but yeah it, it'll be uh, people who are going to lose their minds it's really cool well I mean everybody's very excited for Gemini I haven't read it yet because I am resisting and I am totally going to plug the audiobook here um, I'm literally waiting for the audiobook to be available um I'm sure a lot of people have done it, but a lot of people don't know that it almost feels like an opera that you're listening to. So that's my favorite way of doing it. I did Illuminae with the audio at the same time. Though the guy that reads the briefing notes almost felt like a really creepy Tinkerbell telling you to turn the page. Because he really sounds like the guy with no teeth in 12 Monkeys. So... Oh, yeah, right. He yeah. really does sound like him. So it's like really creepy, you know, turn the page and move on. Um, but it was really good. It was one of my favorite audios of all time. So <clears throat> to anybody yeah, the, listening. God, so the listening library did an amazing job. And I like we can say that because we have nothing to do with the production of the audiobook. But yeah, it, it's probably the best audiobook I've ever heard. Like Janet and the crew of Listening Library are amazing. And they're, they're actually in the process of recording uh, Gemini right now. Like, we just got casting tapes sent to us, and they are they are recording, you know, this week. So we're really excited to see how they what they're gonna do with it. Um, but yeah, like Gemini is, is probably even more visual than Illuminate. There's, there's one aspect of it, uh, which is Hannah's visual diary that, um, like, listening to the audiobook while you read the book will actually be a really cool experience. Yeah, there's, there are visual elements of it that are really challenging to reproduce in an audio environment. But like I said, Janet and her crew are amazing. Yeah, it really was. I mean, I, <clears throat> I, anybody listening, I would personally recommend doing both at the same time. Um, I don't think you can do, I mean, you can do the book on its own, um, but the audio adds just so much more to it, especially the guy that narrates um, the video footage. I think he was my favorite. Besides... Uh, <laughs> Besides briefing no guys. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And I'm sure, I mean, for what I hear, everybody is very much looking forward to Gemini. So uh, we can't wait to hear the news that you guys have in store. And I really do want to thank you very much for your time, uh, which has been a huge chunk of your time. And I know it's uh, your time is a uh, scarce commodity right now. So um, I wanted to thank you for giving us this opportunity and talking about Nevernight. Um, 
and for everybody you know we have never night coming up in less than a month so make sure you pre-order all u.s orders are coming signed by jay and there's some extras um on the uk covers that you can check out on his website so is there anything else you would like to add jay Thank you.